Okay, if we move on, look at the gender. Um, there are um, MOOC learners, a disproportionate number of, um, of males, uh, which is perhaps surprising um, if one looks at the demographics in, um, in, in universities, uh, where in many faculties at least, um, uh, female participation um, has become really quite significant. Um, the, I think the most important statistic really is the second of those, and this is the level of education of those who part the learners who participate in MOOCs. And 70% of the participants have a bachelor's degree or better. Now, what this means is the expectation that MOOCs would appeal mainly to those who had been unable to go to university has turned out not to be particularly well realized because almost three quarters of the learners already have a degree. Almost three quarters of them are in full-time full employment, 14% are in a part-time employment, and 20% are unemployed. The unemployed figures includes those who are, in any case, engaged in some other form of study. The next statistic is an interesting, an interesting one. Um, the number of learners who complete MOOCs this is against the number of those who initially register for them, um, is between 8 and 10%. Uh, if we had that sort of um, dropout rate from our face-to-face -face courses, we'd be seriously alarmed. But this is par for the course for, for MOOCs. So only about 10% of those who start a MOOC actually, um, actually finish it. And finally, there are quite, um, there are quite strong differences in participation across different disciplinary areas. Uh, MOOCs in computer science are particularly, are, particularly, um, are particularly attractive to students, and so are MOOCs in areas such as um, English, language, um, in English language acquisition. And um, our, our university, the University of Auckland, is part of the FutureLearn consortium, um, and um, I believe that their most successful course um, ever um, is a, 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 an English language course which they offered in collaboration with the British Council. So there are, uh, the participation varies quite significantly um, across, across different, um, different disciplines. Now we also have, we also have information um, on how students have responded to the MOOC experience. Um, and the, 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 the indications are that there are a number, of, a number of features of MOOCs which are particularly attractive um, to those who take them. Um, not unexpectedly, um, the learners appreciate the fact that these are free. Um, they don't have to pay to take them. Um, they do, in many cases, have an option to pay a relatively small fee to have a completion certificate at the end, but certainly there's no charge for participation. Uh, MOOCs, um, students find MOOCs very convenient. Um, they, it allows them to fit in their learning um, uh, with, with their other commitments um, and to organise their, their lives in a way which, um, in a way which is um, compatible uh, with their other commitments. And from this point of view, the, um, the heavy participation um, of those in work is a reflection of the convenience of, of MOOCs. It's compatible with keeping, that, keeping a, um, a full-time job. Um, students who participate in MOOCs um, found the content um, very, um, uh, very, very useful. Um, they also found the um, uh, engagement with other learners through various features of the platform uh, very useful. Um, and they also found that the MOOC experience enhanced their capacity to learn through online, through online um, um, processes. Now, there were, however, some, um, uh, some, some sort of um, questions raised by students, some issues raised by students who engaged um, in MOOCs. Um, some of them um, thought that the social experience involved um, was, um, was unhelpfully unlimited. Um, there were sort of weak user communities. People didn't have a sense of who they were studying with in the same way that they would when they're studying um, in face-to-face -face contexts. Um, in some cases, students found the, um, the sort of um, 
availability of information overwhelming. Um, too many postings, um, uh, too much intense um, discussion and so on, which made it difficult for them to engage and difficult for them to identify the parts of these activities which they wanted to engage with um, from, from the others. Um, students found um, group work um, um, assignments in these contexts um, somewhat, somewhat difficult. Um, and the MOOC experiment has also raised questions about how to frame effective forms of online, of, of online assessment. And finally, um, students were concerned um, about the certification issue. Um, are wondering about what the value any, of, any, of any certification um, they, might, they might achieve. Um, and this points to a general problem with MOOCs, and that has to do with the security of assessments and the security or the value of any, um, of any certification uh, which is issued as a result of the MOOC experience. So that's a few sort of basic facts about what has happened in the MOOC world. I want to move on now um, and um, look at um, how far this experience has, um, has been consistent with the expectations that institutions had uh, when they began to be involved with MOOCs. So in a sense we're looking now at the extent to which uh, the experiment has worked as far as institutions are concerned, the extent to which the reality has matched the expectations um, that institutions had uh, when they decided to launch into, into MOOCs. Now, look first at the, um, at the collaborative um, opportunities. And I think it's fair to say that expectations here have been quite, quite well, well realized. Um, the fact that MOOCs are often organized in consortia has been beneficial for the participants. Um, I'm, uh, we're, as I say, we're a member of FutureLearn. Um, I'm a member of the partners, um, the partners group for FutureLearn. Uh, I go to meetings there occasionally, um, and it's actually a very useful sort of collaborative interaction, not just in terms of FutureLearn business, but in terms of our engagement with the other partners um, in the consortia. Uh, one thing that's also emerged is the um, addition of non-university -uni partners to consortia. And this is particularly um, a feature of FutureLearn. FutureLearn includes um, um, a number of um, universities, Russell Group universities, U21 Group universities, and so on. Um, but FutureLearn has also expanded the partnership beyond tertiary institutions to other other institutions which are obviously critical for teaching and learning. So some of the non-university partners of FutureLearn include the British Library, the British Museum, and the British Council. And these people, these institutions, have a vast array, array of resources and expertise which is very useful for universities um, and it's very useful for universities to be engaged in formal collaborative arrangements um, um, with, um, with, with, these, um, with these significant partners. And lastly, on the collaborative um, side, uh, MOOCs have actually provided um, a way of um, enhancing the activity of existing uh, institutional mechanisms. And one, one example I'll give you of this um, is the U21 network. Um, uh, the University of Auckland is a member of this network. It has other members in the UK, in North America, uh, in Europe, in Australia, um, and, in, um, and in Asia. Um, so it's quite a broad-ranging uh, broad network. And one of the things that the teaching and learning section of that ne network has done is it's um, um, made available to its students um, a MOOC which is offered by one of the participating members um, and it's made, those, it's made the MOOC available on particularly sort of um, convenient terms. Um, there was a, um, a, critical, a critical thought MOOC which was developed by the University of Edinburgh um, and has been available um, out of sequence to U21 members. And at the moment U21 is um, developing um, a distinctive MOOC which is sort of tailored for the needs of its membership. The leading organization here is University College Dublin, 
uh, but there will be uh, parts of this MOOC created by other U21 partners. So the MOOC itself will be a sort of U21, um, U21 partnership. So I think this demonstrates the um, extent to which the, um, the um, collaborative um, opportunities of MOOCs have been taken up, um, by, have taken up by, by members. Um, the situation with respect to the ideological expectations um, is, is far more mixed than, than, than we expected. Um, if you think back to those figures um, that I showed you, you will see that, I mean, I think the critical figure there is the, is the second one, the, um, the educational background of students taking MOOCs. Um, and what this suggests is that, um, uh, what this suggests is that um, the, the expectation um, that MOOCs would provide almost, an, almost instantaneously um, a, a vast opportunity for those who had previously um, faced significant barriers in taking university study, um, those realizations have not really been, um, have not really uh, been, been met. The, the, the patterns of participation uh, demonstrate that, to a considerable extent at least, already experienced learners who presumably have already had the privilege of attending a university um, are the major users of the major users of MOOCs. Um, this particular expectation um, uh, probably didn't think carefully enough um, about the um, extent to which significant sections of populations um, in developed and in developing countries um, do not have particularly good access to the quality of internet that's required for um, engagement in MOOCs. Uh, there is a sort of ongoing digital disadvantage which has an impact on the uh, access to um, these forms of learning. And the last point there, which I, I think in some ways sort of explains a great deal here, um, the fact of the matter is that online learning is actually quite difficult for students. It's quite demanding, it requires self-discipline, it requires motivation, um, it requires people to organise their time in a particular way, um, it requires them to um, avoid distractions, um, and all these things are actually quite difficult, and they're likely to be more difficult for those from um, disadvantaged parts of the population than for those in more privileged situations. If you live in very crowded living conditions, it's very hard, even if you have the internet, to concentrate on taking a MOOC. If you live in a house where you have your own room, these things are, are much more straightforward and so on. So there are sort of significant challenges involved in distant learning. Um, and it's not surprising that even for this population, the completion rate is relatively low. Um, and if you look at other forms of, um, if you, you look at other forms of distance learning, um, the um, the uh, completion rates are usually significantly below those for other sort of parallel educational experiences. Uh, we have um, in New Zealand one of the universities uh, runs extramural courses, um, courses which are taught to students all over the country. Um, and, the and despite their best efforts, it's a very good university, it's very experienced, the pass rates and the completion rates for students in those programs is probably about 20% lower than for students in equivalent face-to-face -face courses. So this is cha cha challenging, um, and it does raise questions about the expectation that MOOCs would provide an opportunity for, uh, for everyone to um, engage in, um, in tertiary, tertiary level study. If we move on to the, if we move on then to the reputational, um, the, the reputational sort of advantages, um, I think this has been a beneficial um, to, to a considerable extent. Um, I know that the University of Auckland thinks that it's been very beneficial to be involved in FutureLearn. It's helped our collaboration with the partners there. Um, and also it's sort of important, it's been important um, in terms of um, um, our reputation with policymakers, uh, one of the groups of people who were particularly keen on MOOCs when they first appeared on the horizon were people in governments because they could see a, a vehicle here for producing very cheap versions of tertiary education which would help them to solve their sort of participation goals. Um, and so when universities took up the challenge of MOOCs, 
um, members of government actually looked kindly on them because they thought they were um, ceasing to be elitist, were seeking to expand um, the range of their activities uh, beyond their traditional constituencies. Now, the, another, another sort of expectation has to do with student recruitment. Um, and here I think the, the results have been a bit mixed. Um, given the um, distinctive demographic of those who take, take MOOCs, um, the scope for many forms of student recruitment is quite limited because 70% of the population already have a degree. So you can't expect to recruit people into undergraduate programs. There may still be some expectation that you will attract them into postgraduate and to professional programs. I think, however, the, um, the um, profile-raising benefit of MOOCs um, is likely, uh, perhaps, to produce long-term benefits for institutions. Uh, they have um, a higher international profile than they might have done in the past. But the challenge here is to convert that profile into making one's institution more attractive to international students. It's not going to happen automatically. Um, it needs a, lot, a great deal of careful thought and a great deal of, um, of, of careful, careful work. Um, the third point here has to do with the sort of data that one can get from MOOCs. Uh, one of the features of MOOCs um, is that one, can, one has large populations and one has an electronic trace of what students are doing. One can analyze their participation. One can see when students drop in and out of courses, see which assignments they do, um, see what they're interested in and what is not of interest to them. Um, and it's quite possible um, that this, this information might be used to put together communities of interest uh, to identify um, sort of students who might be interested um, in, in further study and who might be targets for our recruitment efforts. Move on now to the third, uh, the last expectation. And this was the financial one. This was always a bit vague. Um, and when MOOCs first became sort of um, uh, significant, the question that everybody asked, including people who were spending money on them, was what's the business model? Because there seemed to be a lot of expenditure and no revenue. Um, and institutions throughout the world, um, educational institutions, um, are facing increasingly sort of stringent financial um, barriers. Um, so the, the financial questions are, um, are, are, quite, are quite important. Now there's a bit of a paradox here, uh, because one of, the, one of the features of MOOCs, which I think took most people by surprise, certainly took us by surprise, um, is that they're actually much more expensive to produce and maintain um, than we ever thought. I don't think we really gave it a, a clear view about what would be required to, to produce these. Um, and I, uh, paradoxically, if one is interested in MOOCs as a way of raising the profile of an institution, they're going to be even more expensive because you've got to make MOOCs which look really good, they've got to be very sophisticated, they've got to incorporate a whole range of often quite expensive um, electronic teaching aids which increases, which increases the, the, the price. So the financial, the, the financial issue needs to be, needs to be set um, against this um, important question uh, about production costs uh, which no one had a particularly um, clear view on when, when, when we started. These production costs have to do with the real cost of using academics to develop these courses. And the academic input is often really quite significant. Um, and if you put a price on this in terms of the salary you're paying, um, it becomes a pretty expensive um, operation. Um, those academic staff members in this context need a great deal of support from professional staff members. So this is another cost. Um, if production is outsourced, that's an expensive, that's an expensive operation, um, particularly if you're looking for very good quality videos um, and production. Um, and we've also found that if you build in a lot of interactive work in the courses, then it's expensive to run the courses because you need to have people online to respond to student queries, to manage um, um, uh, notice boards and all those sorts of things. Um, so um, we, our first MOOC was on statistics first year statistics. Um, it was a very successful MOOC. 
Um, and um, interestingly, it was particularly attractive in its first running to people teaching statistics in a range of universities over the world. So they asked a whole lot of very sophisticated questions when they were working through the MOOC themselves, and we had to spend quite a lot of money to answer those questions. We couldn't have um, teaching assistants doing it. We had to have the professors and so on. So there was a big commitment of time. Um, so it was a success in a way, but the success was more expensive than we, than we, um, than we, than we envisaged. The cost of these MOOCs varies very greatly, but even at the bottom end, it's pretty expensive. Um, 38,000 US dollars up to 325,000 uh, US dollars. And as you'll see, three quarters of those costs are, um, are, um, um, are staff costs, personnel costs. Uh, the cost per completer varies between 74 US dollars um, and um, 272 US dollars, um, which sounds actually very reasonable if you, if you compare that with the price of each student completing a face-to-face -face course. Um, and this, of course, is one of the huge advantages of the scale of MOOCs, but the problem at the moment is there's very little revenue to offset the cost that you've produced. So they're relatively cheap per student, but if there's no revenue per student, then you still face um, the prospect of financial difficulty. Now, a number of the features of, of, of MOOCs um, are um, sort of a very, are, are, if MOOCs are to be very effective, um, they, they, they require the development of, of features uh, which, are, which are quite expensive. Um, although some of these features might well then, and we'll come on to this, be used for um, teaching on campus. So the, the initial investment is in the MOOC, but these, these features can then be redeployed elsewhere. Um, the production values, this is, a major, this is a major sort of variable which determines the price of, um, the, the price of MOOCs. Um, and I guess it depends on the context and the culture. But actually, um, at least in New Zealand, um, and I suspect elsewhere, the way that academics are used to working is not actually particularly efficient in terms of producing MOOCs. Uh, if, you, if you are using um, recording studios, if you're using animation, uh, if you're using expensive equipment, uh, you need to do things in a very precise and very quick way. Uh, you can't endlessly rerun things. Um, and you know, the movie industry depends upon doing things very quickly and very efficiently because the cost of each activity is very high. This is not the way that many academics are used to working. They're used to working according to their own pace, to doing things in their own time, and so on. Um, and this mode of work, it's perfectly fine for, for regular academic work, can greatly increase the cost of, um, the co the cost of producing MOOCs. Um, the, um, the personnel times, um, there's just some figures there, um, um, are, are sometimes surprisingly, um, surprisingly great. Um, it's, much, it's turned out to be more time consuming than we imagined to take material from a face-to-face -face course and repurpose it for a MOOC course. This is not a straightforward transfer. A lot of thought needs to go on to on taking material that you might deliver in a conventional lecture and then representing that, repositioning it for, for, for inclusion in, in, in a MOOC. Um, and video recording is very time consuming um, and very expensive. And when one moves on to more sophisticated things such as animation, um, the production costs increase even more. So there are real challenges for institutions in terms of the financial cost of MOOCs um, and in terms of, um, of essentially balancing that cost against the other realizations um, that they might have had. Um, now, we move on now to look at some of the, um, um, some of the, um, the sort of potential benefits um, that, might, that might emerge from, 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 the, um, from, from the MOOC experiment. I think the, the experiment has produced a lot of very interesting information and a lot of very interesting experience um, about course of design and delivery in, on -term, in online contexts. And I think it, it sort of generated challenges which have had to be met, which we can use not just in MOOCs, but in a whole range of online contexts, and also in those contexts 
where we combine online teaching uh, with face-to-face -face teaching. Uh, MOOCs have also started to produce um, significant um, uh, um, bodies of data about the way in which students learn, which are, can be used in the development of MOOCs, but also have implications for teaching and learning in other contexts. So, you know, we have the biggest data set about, about students that we're ever going to get from MOOCs. You know, thousands and thousands of examples which we can, we can or, or of, um, of people in a sample, um, and we can get some, some important sort of experience from analysing this data. And since the experience is online, the data is very easy to get. It just needs to be harvested. You don't have to have surveys or anything. It's there for, it's there for the taking. Uh, one, one sort of caveat, one reservation here, is that at the moment this data is of limited interest because the population taking MOOCs is a very distinctive population. If most of these people already have degrees, you can't learn that much from the data about how people who are first-time learners will behave. So that's a sort of um, a function of the, of the distinctive analytics, uh, of the, the distinctive um, participation. But nevertheless, uh, learning analytics is a, an area which is particularly um, fruitful um, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, institutions' uh, utilisation of the experience of, um, of MOOCs. Now, um, another, another sort of um, positive thing looking forward um, is that people are increasingly realize, uh, realizing that one can reuse MOOC material um, for and integrate it with campus learning. So it's not a question of either having massive online learning and much more sort of um, localized and, um, and sort of niche um, uh, campus learning. One can utilize material from, you, from MOOCs for, for campus learning, um, and this enhances the experience of our students on campus. It also allows us to get some financial benefit from the large investment that we've, um, that we've um, placed in MOOCs. Now, one reservation here um, has to do with the, um, with, with the extent to which um, it's kind of feasible to use MOOC material which is produced by other people. Uh, university teaching is quite distinctive. Um, we place a great deal of stress upon the autonomy of the teacher. The teacher takes Shakespeare, for example, and presents their own interpretation of Shakespeare. And all around the world there will be people who are Shakespeare scholars who are teaching their students Shakespeare on the basis of their research-informed understanding of Shakespeare. And this is a sort of important and distinctive feature of the university context. And if we just took MOOCs that other people had produced and dumped them into our courses or into our programs, um, the university experience would change quite significantly. And I think the excitement that students feel in university contexts um, would decline. We need, in other words, to, to have to, 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 to uh, retain opportunities for our academic staff to be creative, to be the agent who generates the material which our students then, then engage with. And in university teaching, um, it's quite a personal experience. Um, it's, it's a sort of um, a relationship between a particular teacher and a particular class, and that can't be replicated in an online situation. And the more online material, which is sort of imported from outside, um, is used in on context, on campus contexts, um, the more that idea of the personal relationship between the teacher and the student uh, will be will will be will be eroded. Um, one way in which MOOCs might be used to good, to good advantage. Um, is to think about the use of MOOCs which have been created for the population at large and um, have been delivered through one of the big platforms to think how those MOOCs might be reconfigured and then used internally for on-credit courses. So the, the internal version would only be available for courses for students who are enrolled in the institution who paid their fees and would then, if they passed the course, get credit towards their degree. Now, we've done some work on this at Auckland, 
um, and we, we're by no means alone at this. Uh, at the moment, we have running on FutureLearn um, a very successful um, MOOC on critical thinking. This is a MOOC from the philosophy department. Um, it's based upon a very successful first year course, which we've offered for about the last 10 years. I think there's about 2,000 students enrolled for this course every year. It's usually taught in three different, um, three different versions. Um, and um, the people who taught that course um, decided to make a MOOC of it. Um, the MOOC is only eight weeks, so they've sort of drawn from their course. What they're doing now is they're taking the MOOC and then extending it back out to a 12-week course. Um, and in the first semester of next year, this is going to be an option which is available for students enrolled in the University of Auckland. So rather than showing up to the class in, um, I think it's Philosophy 109, I think, I can't remember the number, 101. 105, Philosophy 105, rather than doing the face-to-face the, 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 um, -face version, students will have the option of enrolling for the MOOC version. There will be secure assessment. There will be face-to-face -face advice for those students. So it's a bit different from a classic MOOC. Um, and they will be able to sit formal exams either at the university or at some other secure center at another university around the country or around the world and get full credit for that course. So we've invested in the MOOC. We're now using that material um, for, uh, in order to provide students with an alternative experience uh, which will uh, allow them to um, study more flexibly. Um, it will allow a student, for example, who's almost completed their degree and moved away from Auckland to pick up a course that they might need to, to complete their studies. So that's, uh, um, that's, that, that, that's a sort of, um, um, a sort of um, an interesting option for the future. Uh, we also have an academic integrity MOOC, which started from an internal academic integrity um, class, um, an online class that we require all our students to take, whether they're undergraduates or postgraduates. Um, the people concerned with this, with this MOOC, which included um, Dr. Lee Wang, um, then developed it for a future, learn, a future learn version, which has sort of general application. Um, it doesn't have the material which was particular to the University of Auckland. It has sort of generic material on academic integrity. Um, and the international uptake of that MOOC has been, has, has been, has been very strong. So this is not strictly speaking a full credit course, but it is a course which all our students, um, which all our students have to take. Um, and I think um, uh, some institutions are now requiring their students to do the MOOC version um, as part of their sort of basic um, basic requirements. Now one can also um, what I've called here cannibalizing MOOCs, that is chopping them up and taking bits of them and using them in various courses. So rather than if, if one is teaching a course on the history of modern art, for example, there might, be, um, there might be a segment from a MOOC which would be particularly useful for part of that course. Um, and you can direct your students towards that segment. And so rather than asking them to read chapter 15 of a textbook, you ask them to, to do that section of a particular MOOC. Uh, and this is a valuable use of, um, a valuable use of MOOCs. Um, it means that the staff member is controlling the course. They're deciding what the student is directed to. They're almost like a sort of um, a curator um, who is taking objects from around the world and, and putting them into the course. But the, the condition there is that, that, that this, this can't be done in a sort of random way. It requires a great deal of thought. The, um, the objects, the, the bits from the MOOCs, have to be curated, they have to be put in context of the particular course for which, they're, for which they're being used. So this is a relatively sort of intensive activity, but it's a way in which um, on-campus learning um, can utilize material which was developed originally for um, MOOC, MOOC delivery.